Hey everyone, I'm glad you joined me today and uh, we're going to be studying out of the book of Revelation and and uh, I guarantee you, if you'll get your Bible and read with me, there'll be a blessing. And what I've done, I've taken my notes and, and put them on this board in this drawing so that you'll have a visual just like I do. And you can stop the video anytime you get ready and find the verses as we read along. But there's a lot of misconceptions and uh, I wanted to clear some of them up. This is a basic study and, and we're going to talk about what you can expect to happen at the time of your death and what happens to your spirit when you're raised up to be with the Lord. But there's 22 chapters in Revelation. And the, there's some chronology to all these events here in Revelation. We're in the present church age. The, fifth, uh, the fourth chapter is when John's raised up and he has a vision in heaven. And Jesus reveals all this to him. And he's actually in heaven at that particular time. The fifth is the seven sealed book is opened up. And six through 19 is the tribulation. And it lasts for seven years. And the church, I believe the church is caught up at this time when John uh, has his uh, catching up into heaven himself and has his vision. Jesus comes back with his saints and comes back to earth. Sets up his millennial kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth. We go into eternity. Those that are that know Jesus, that are saved, they'll be caught up at this time before all this happens. And those that don't, they're going to remain in the grave and they'll be raised up here after the millennial kingdom to uh, stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment. There's a lot of people that would uh, believe differently than I do. They think that this resurrection and judgments, you know, here and here and some people think all this has already taken place. But I'm going to show you in this order why I think it's here. And this tribulation is God's wrath poured out on earth. His righteous and just anger toward evil. So you, you don't want to be here at this time because it's going to be the worst times ever in the history of the earth. This is a seven-year period we uh, learn in Dan 9 from the time the church is resurrected and judged to the time when we come back to reign with him on earth for a thousand years. But uh, we'll show the uh, authorship here in Revelation 1, 9 through 11. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, not this tribulation, but the tribulation he was going through, the persecution, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he was there exiled, imprisoned on this island when he wrote this book. It goes on to say in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And the Lord said, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book 
and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So this last church here mentioned, Laodicea, Laodicea, most people agree that that's representative of the church at the end of the church age. And it had a lot of problems, but the problems persisted even back then throughout the church age. But we'll go on to read the, uh, about the last letter to the Laodicea church, Revelations 3, 20 through 22. Here the Lord is speaking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So you can read the rest of these verses about these what, what was going on in these churches, but Jesus is standing at the door. He's outside and he's knocking. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup. So he was on the outside And this was the layout, the condition of the Laodicean church. Now, we're going to do a little study on what happens. That's at the end of the church age in chapter 3. And we'll study chapter 4 up here, but we're going to talk about what happens to you when you, when you pass away. The uh, let's go to First Thessalonians four, thirteen through eighteen. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Meaning, I, you need to know this. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Them which are asleep, those who have passed on, when after you die, that's how they refer to the body as asleep. It's only the body that sleeps. When you die, your um, your spirit automatically it goes to heaven, and you're with Him. At that moment, but your body is in the grave, asleep. And he's and he's saying you don't have to sorrow those loved ones that have passed away, that are asleep in Christ. You don't have to have that sorrow that those that don't have that hope have. You can grieve, but you shouldn't have that sorrow. If you have that blessed hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So we're, our spirit is raised in a moment. And when he comes back, he's bringing our spirit with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That prevent means go before. So the living will be raised after those that are asleep in Jesus. And when they talk about we, we talk about believers in the church. 
which are alive and remain will be called up to, will be translated. Uh, those that are asleep in Jesus will be resurrected to a glorified body and those that are alive at that time will, will, will be translated. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. So your soul, when you a believer, your soul is automatically goes to be with him in paradise. And your body remains in the grave of sleep in Jesus. All right, first Corinthians fifteen, fifty one through fifty three. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery, something that hasn't been told before, or maybe that's not have been known. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in 52, we see that this happens all in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We're changed. There's nothing corruptible or mortal is going to in, enter into the kingdom of heaven. And it's going to happen suddenly. First, 2 Corinthians 5.10 This is the judgment seat of Christ. There's a name for this judgment. And it's here in verse 10. For we, believers in Christ, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we're going to be judged. We have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll be judged for everything done in the body, whether it be good or bad. The only thing that's going to go into eternity is what you've done to further his kingdom here on earth. We're going to see that there's going to be rewards for that but we are going to stand and give an account for the things we've done. Our works, the things that we've done for him, are going to be tried in the fire. This judgment's going to be a fiery judgment. We can read about it in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work 
shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So this isn't a judgment, you know, on whether uh, about your salvation. If you if you stand before the Lord at this judgment, you're a saved man. But you're going to be judged for, for everything that you've done in the body while you were serving him. You don't want to stand there empty-handed and uh, have all nothing but uh, wood, hay, and stubble. It's all going to be burned up. And there's going to be rewards as you go through this life, and they're going to, you're going to take them with you. You're going to get rewarded for the things you do for him to further his kingdom. A lot of things we do that we think we're doing good, if it's not for him, it's not going to last. It's going to be burned up. And we'll suffer loss. If we haven't done anything for them, we're going to suffer loss. But what? Hopefully we'll be rewarded. And then we're going to talk about the uh, elders' crown of glory. That's a reward. And there's five different crowns that are talked about uh, in the Bible, and you can study them. But uh, we're going to talk about this one particular crown that the elders receive. The elders are pastors of the church, the bishops. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind. Neither has being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away, that fadeth not away, incorruptible, a crown of glory. The chief shepherd being Jesus Christ. When and when the chief shepherd shall appear, he's going to appear. We're going to meet him in the air. He's going to bring back the saints that, have, that are in the graves, and we're going to meet him in the air. And this is when he shall appear. So there's certain qualifications for bishops or pastors or the elders of the church. And if they don't meet those qualifications, they're not going to be honored. And here it explains what they need to be also, right here, how they need to be and how they need to deal with the church. But what they've done to further his kingdom, there'll be a reward, a crown of glory. Amen. All right, we're, now we're going back to Revelation when John has this vision right here into heaven that he shares with us. Revelation 4, 1 through 4. It 
starts out in verse 1. After this, after what? After he wrote the letters to the churches, after he wrote the last letter to the last church, which was Laodicea, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Amen. So he sees this throne, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. What I understand, sardine was one of the precious stones in that time, and I understand it's red like like rubies. It's just a beautiful red. And here it is, jasper, and then this rainbow round about the throne was as unto emerald. What a beautiful sight. And around about was these 24 elders, and, and they were sitting in these small thrones. They call them seats here, but they're thrones that these elders are sitting on. And they're ready to judge. They've already been judged, and they've received their crowns right here. Clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And immediately he was in the spirit. Caught up into heaven. Amen. Revelation 5, 8 through 10. What a wonderful thing. Verse 8, this is a seven-sealed book. And when he had taken the book, excuse me, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou that was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. These are redeemed men by his blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. They are representatives of the church. the elders falling down before the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Amen. Worshiping Him, glorifying Him. So the church is up here for seven years, and there's all this is going on, this great the tribulation and great tribulation. 
for seven years we read about it in Dan, uh, the ninth chapter, that it lasts for seven years. And while this is going on, there's events up here. There's a lot of stuff that's happening simultaneously during this period. And there's going to be people that are not caught up that aren't part of the church. There'll be men that will be saved. They'll come to know Jesus. And more than likely, they're going to be martyred. But they will be saved and they will be resurrected. Let's, let's go to Matthew 24, 21 through 22. This is Jesus speaking. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. So there's, there's a, this is a specific time on earth that, is, that has never happened before, nor ever shall be. And verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Uh, shortened to what? Now, evidently, it's going to be seven, shortened to seven years because that's what was prophesied by Dan. And the elect, those are the people that are saved through God's foreknowledge so like I said there will be some that are saved during this time and they are part of the elect and they can be Jew or Gentile Matthew 24 29 through 31 immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other amen immediately after the tribulation the sun shall be darkened the stars will fall the moon shall not give her light, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now this is a sign for those that are on earth that are still alive. And he said, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. It's not going to be good for those that see this sign. I want to back up for a minute and talk about signs. It's it's a popular thing for people that are teaching latter times to talk about these signs, and people are real interested in these signs. And we don't have to concern ourselves with them because we're going to be caught up just as John was in chapter 4. We're going to be be in heaven with him with our glorified bodies before all this takes place this is his wrath and there's plenty of scriptures that talk about we're not subject to his wrath his wrath is his righteous anger 
and just anger toward evil. And this is what this tribulation is about. And if, you know, people can move this, uh, this uh, catching up of the church anywhere they want to in here. But I can't speak for them, but for myself, if I was to believe it was anywhere else besides here, I would be looking for signs instead of him. I couldn't convince myself that he was coming until I saw these signs before what I believe to be his second coming. So I'm not even trying to time it. At the end of the church age, that's where I believe we're going to be caught up. And there's other verses I'm not going to go into right now because I'm not trying to teach the timing of this resurrection. But I can't honestly say that if I believed it was anywhere else that I would be looking for him. And that's what the, the significance of this lesson is, is to be looking for him that that glorious hope. Amen. We don't want to be like these people there that's going to mourn at his coming and see that sign in the clouds. So, Zechariah 14, he's another uh, Old Testament prophet that prophesied this coming down to the earth with his saints. That's a four through six. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach under us all, unto us all. Yea, ye shall flee like ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. Amen. And then we'll finally get into Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Eleven through sixteen. And this is John. In chapter 19. And I saw in heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 
Revelation 1, 7 through 8. This will be a victorious time. Evil will be defeated. And we will enter into the millennial kingdom. He's not coming back like he did the first time. Revelation 1, 7 and 8. This is John speaking. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. All the earth, all of the earth shall wail because of him. The Lord said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and is, which is to become, or which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. We've made a full circle. The Lord's coming back with a vengeance. It's where he's going to pour out his wrath. And we're going to be with him. There's a marriage of the lamb up here while this is going on. And the church is his bride the bride of Christ. And we're all coming with him, all the saints, back to earth, to rule and reign with him. Amen. Turn to Titus 2.13. We'll be closing this up. It's just some, some more things to think about. I've enjoyed this lesson. It's, it has been a blessing for me to put this together. And I hope you've been able to hang with me and had your Bible and uh, continue to study even after this is over. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I was hoping he'd be here before this lesson was over. But looking, always looking for that blessed hope. We don't want to see what they saw here. We want to be with him. Whether in the body or out of the body. First John three, two, three. Verse two and three. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that there is we again. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Looking for that blessed, that glorious appearing, having that blessed hope, the hope that purifies there's a purification when we live and wait on his glorious appearing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. I'll go back up one and we'll start with 16. 
Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Without ceasing. Walk with a prayer on your heart, looking for that blessed hope that purifies. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Lord willing, I'll see you later.